<laughs> and yet to the subjects do not have the volume of global mania. The third line, hemoglobin Milwaukee, close to home here, uh, this, uh, this is another kind of ferri hemoglobinemia. In the alpha helix, the fourth residue, there are three and six tenths residues per turn. So the fourth residue from the beta chain, abnormality, the fourth residue from the 63rd position, the 67th position, has glutamate in place of valine. Glutamate has a negative charge, and because this is just one turn of the helix, this negative charge is brought around close to the iron atom. The electrostatic effect of the negative charge just cancels uh, that of the positive charge, and the iron atom oxidizes to the ferric state. Well, uh, diseases can't be understood more thoroughly than these diseases are. The next question is, uh, is there some way of introducing a positive charge into those chains? Can you get a small molecule, say, that would fit in there? Perhaps so. No one has thought of one yet. So, no one has thought of one yet, but uh, at least uh, you have, you can see that there are ways of uh, tackling the problem of the suffering caused by these diseases. Here again, I think that uh, the carriers of the genes should be advised not to have children, that it's their duty to society not to, and uh, they shouldn't inflict. Uh, they shouldn't take the 25% chance, if that's what it is, of inflicting, uh, uh, or 50% chance in this case, inflicting uh, the disease upon uh, uh, their children. The next slide. In the paper in 1968 on orthomolecular psychiatry, I drew a curve showing vertically the a state of well-being of a, an individual, and horizontally the uh, intake of vital substance. I've put an arrow, optimal functioning, and then over uh, functioning of the fittest strain with decreased burden of machinery for synthesizing the vital substance. The argument that I was making there is uh, if you are able to manufacture some molecules that you need in your body, uh, will you manufacture them in the optimum concentration? And my answer was that in general, you will manufacture them in something less than the optimum concentration. If we look at that uh, arrow nearer to me, uh, there's some machinery operating in the body to produce the substance in certain amount, 0.05. Uh, if we doubled the amount of machinery in the body, we could uh, get over to the other arrow with an increase of a few percent in the state of well-being. But uh, we would have the burden of operating the extra machinery, twice as great. And that burden uh, corresponds to the imposition of a negative slope, uh, which uh, if it were just equal to the positive slope at the place where the arrow is, would give a horizontal slope and would re represent uh, the uh, position, the optimum for, uh, for uh, uh, with inclusion of the burden for synthesizing the uh, operating machinery to synthesize the substance. Now, if uh, we have uh, an animal that is manufacturing a vital substance at, say, the position corresponding to the arrow near me, and he gets access to the substance from an exogenous source if he begins eating food that contains the substance. Then uh, there may occur a mutation in which uh, the mutant sloughs off the machinery, loses the genes, does not manufacture the 
does not uh, synthesize the enzymes and does not carry on the manufacturing process. The mutant will have an advantage over the wild type then that has the machinery. And the mutant will uh, win out. Uh, Zamenhof and Eichhorn a couple of years, well, 1968, just when my paper was published, uh, perhaps 1967, uh, published an account of their experiments in which they uh, took uh, bacteria, uh, Bacillus subtilis, uh, the wild type which could manufacture indole-containing substances, tryptophan, and uh, a mutant that required these substances in the environment. When they put equal numbers of the wild type cells and the mutant cells in the same medium with a supply of the indole and allowed uh, them to reproduce for 80 generations, they found that uh, there were a million times as many cells of the mutant as of the wild type. The mutant had won out. Uh, if the uh, amount of machinery that was deleted was small uh, in one mutant and large or larger in another mutant in case there were a series of reactions involved as in the synthesis of vitamin B1, then the mutant that had sloughed off the m more machinery uh, would win out in this competition. The next slide. This shows what happened. Well, here we have a, a curve uh, for the rate of growth of a mutant red bread mold, Neurospora, as studied by Beadle and Tatum around 1940, as a function of the amount of pyridoxine in the medium. Pyridoxine is vitamin B6. This was a mutant that required exogenous vitamin B6. The curve is still going up. The normal strain manufactures its own pyridoxine and it grows at the rate indicated by the point there at about 95% uh, of what seems to be the maximum. Beetle and Tatum never carried the curves on to find out where the maximum is. They never found out what the optimum amount of this vitamin was for the mutant. Next slide, 1941, it says on the slide. Here's Beetle and Tatum, Tatum and Beetle 1942, with another uh, growth substance uh, para-aminobenzoic acid, and the curve is similar. Uh, the next slide. Uh, this is a logarithmic plot. Uh, you start out, well, it has that sigmoid S shape, and uh, you are getting a little increase, a few percent, with every doubling of the amount of the para acid. The next slide. This indicates that it might take quite a lot of a growth substance to be to, uh, uh, well, increasing amounts. Double, every doubling may give you a, an, a few percent uh, extra energy, better health. Uh, we carried out in our laboratory, Lou Brenneman, uh, Dr. Lou Brenneman working with me, uh, studies like Beetle and Tatum's in which we looked at the other end of the curve where you begin to get a decrease in growth rate because of too much of the growth substance. Or in this case, it was usually not the growth substance, but just something that was added. The next to the bottom curve is uh, aspirin. And the red mark over there, uh, the place where the curve bends down is the place where the aspirin concentration is enough to poison the red bread mold and keep it from growing. The log of the concentration is shown at the bottom and uh, in milligrams per liter. That's three, that means 1,000 milligrams per liter, a gram of aspirin per liter. The lethal dose for a human being uh, divided by the volume of body fluids of a human being is indicated by the red mark. And for all four substances shown there, we see that the same concentration of the substance is toxic for the red bread mold as for human being. I was interested in this because of uh, the question of how toxic is vitamin C? Uh, nobody has ever succeeded in killing himself by eating vitamin C. Uh, people have eaten as much as a quarter of a pound at a sitting. and. Uh, <laughs> without getting sick. And uh, it is likely, uh, here, the result we get, uh, 
The third curve from the top is vitamin C. It's beginning to bend over there at a concentration corresponding to about uh, 10 kilograms of vitamin C for uh, an adult human being. Uh, of course, it may be that the red bread mold is not enough like a human being uh, for us to draw these, this conclusion rigorously, but nevertheless, it is. Uh, we're going ahead with studying other poisons and cold medicines and so on uh, to see how, uh, what the toxic amounts are for red bread mold in comparison with the known toxic amounts for human beings. The uh, next slide. The, uh, Here's a little uh, theory, the Michaelis-Menten equation. It, uh, these curves may be said to give the amount of active enzyme resulting from uh, a combination of a coenzyme uh, with the protein apoenzyme. Uh, when the equilibrium constant for combination has the various values shown, ranging over a 200-fold range, you see a, quite a low concentration of the coenzyme, which is called substrate here. Uh, you get 90% uh, combination. There'd be a lot of active enzyme. This might represent, for example, a combination of an apoenzyme, protein apoenzyme, with vitamin B12, a coenzyme, uh, when the person ingests vitamin B12 at the normal rate of a few micrograms per day. Here, uh, if the combination constant were 200 times smaller, then you would have to have a concentration of vitamin B12 200 times greater in order to achieve the same amount of combination and the same amount of active enzyme. There are people who have the disease methylmalonic aciduria. Um, ordinary people have an enzyme uh, that uh, catalyzes the conversion of methylmalonic acid to succinic acid that is then oxidized by the Krebs cycle mechanism. Some people lack this enzyme and uh, the methylmalonic acid builds up in the uh, body fluids just the way that phenylalanine does for phenylketonurics. And they have, uh, they are mentally retarded and have physical manifestations. If these patients are given uh, a thousand times the normal intake of vitamin B12, half of them no longer show manifestations of the disease. The disease can be palliated. That's an example of orthomolecular medicine involving vitamins and requiring that the vitamin be given in a thousand times or several hundred times uh, the uh, amount that uh, corresponding to normal ingestion. With those uh, patients, it seems clear that the apoenzyme has a point mutation, one amino acid replaced by another, in such a way that the combining constant with the vitamin B12 to form the active enzyme is far smaller than usual, but you can overcome that by having the higher concentration of the vitamin B12. With the other half of the patient, the other half do not respond. Uh, why? Uh, perhaps if they were to get 10,000 times, some of them uh, would uh, respond to this therapy. But perhaps the defect, the gene defect, is such that uh, uh, no protein is manufactured at all, as in the case of hemoglobin H uh, among uh, the hemoglobinemias, uh, where uh, no alpha chain is manufactured at all. Next slide. I think there are great possibilities here and that it is necessary to uh, work uh, to discover uh, what uh, the nature of human beings are and uh, how they would respond to uh, changing the concentrations of these molecules. I think that everybody needs extra, amino, extra ascorbic acid, extra vitamin C that we all suffer, except a few fortunate ones who ingest a lot of vitamin C, from a deficiency in vitamin C, and that we would be protected against colds. Uh, Cowan, Deal, and Baker at the University of Minnesota carried out a fine study which was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association in 1942. It was a double-blind study. Dr. Cowan has informed me. I think he's head of the student health service over where is the University of Minnesota, Minneapolis. And uh, they found in this double-blind study with about 400 uh, 
students over a 28-week period uh, that there were 15% fewer colds in the vitamin C subjects, getting only about 200 milligrams a day, and uh, that uh, there was uh, a 31% uh, smaller amount of illness. The colds were not so severe, so that the total amount of illness per person was 31% less. And they say that these results are statistically significant. Here it says P less than 0.03, uh, significant at the 97% confidence level, or for the other one, the 99.9% .9 confidence level. In the body of their paper, that this is probably a real effect that one might to question its practical importance. The summary of the paper is quite short and simple. It says, we have shown that large amounts of vitamin C have no practical value in decreasing either the in incidence or severity of the common cold. How do you explain that? Uh, it's hard for me to explain it. It is, in a sense, true if we accept uh, the definition of practical that they accepted that nobody is interested in a 15 or 31 percent decrease in amount of illness, but I think it misrepresents their investigation. Uh, people who quote it read only the abstract and say that they found no effect. They leave out the practical usually. Next slide. They didn't go ahead, they didn't have the idea that most scientists would have. If we get this big an effect, with uh, uh, 200 milligrams, would we get twice as big an effect with 400 milligrams? They just dropped the study. Here we have Glazebrook and Thompson. They found about a 15%, 25 percent decrease in the uh, number of uh, number admitted to sick quarters. Uh, they found. Uh, 50% decrease in the average days in hospital and 100% decrease in the cases of pneumonia and acute rheumatism. This wasn't a double-blind study, but uh, there's no reason to doubt the reliability of the investigators. The next slide. Uh, probably the best study is the one by Ritzel. 61% decrease in the number of days of illness, 65% decrease in the incidence of individual symptoms. There's a 45% decrease in the number of colds, not shown on this diagram. <clears throat> this was with one gram of ascorbic acid per day. School boys, all boys, uh, 15 to 17 years old in ski camps under close observation. Next slide. <clears throat> Now, oh, this perhaps isn't legible. It just reminds me about Harnick. Uh, I don't know that it's worth reading either. Let's turn the lights on. Uh, just a few months ago, uh, Harnick and Schwartz and other investigators in the University of Maryland, uh, could I have the lights, please? Uh, turn off the slide. Harnick and Schwartz reported a study that they had carried out, and uh, every newspaper in the country carried it, and the medical m magazines and so on. Uh, they, uh, uh, and this was interpreted as showing that vitamin C doesn't have any value. Uh, I saw a report saying that it was a study in a large, uh, a large uh, institution. Uh, it was a large institution, but I don't know that that's significant because it involved only 21 subjects. Uh, uh, Eleven of them uh, received uh, vitamin C, and uh, 10 of them uh, received a placebo. And they all had squirted into their noses a uh, hundred times the tissue culture infective dose of a certain rhinovirus. They all came down with colds. <laughs> and so they reported that vitamin C had no value. Uh, that's quite true, vitamin C had no value. Uh, I was reminded by a correspondent of a similar investigation to find out whether uh, calcium strengthens eggshells. You take 21 hens 
and you give 11 of them extra calcium and 10 of them a placebo, and then you take the 21 eggs and hit each one with a sledgehammer. <laughs> uh, the, the, Well, now, uh, the fact is, there have been only four double-blind studies of the common cold carried out to, uh, in which uh, subjects were exposed to the common cold in the ordinary way, did not have colds at the beginning of the experiment, and uh, received ascorbic acid or a placebo uh, continuously for a period of time. All four gave the result uh, that ascorbic acid has a value. And uh, the statistical significance of uh, the combination of the four combined in the standard way by Ronald Fisher's method, uh, they were independent investigations, is such that we can say that there's only one chance in 42,000 uh, that the conclusion that ascorbic acid has more value in protecting against the common cold than a placebo is right. If you take, uh, I think that uh, everyone needs uh, between two grams and 10 grams of ascorbic acid a day, or that this would be the optimum. Uh, you know, ascorbic acid is a special vitamin. With other vitamins, vitamin A, vitamin B1, B6, pyridoxine, and so on, uh, every animal requires this vitamin exogenously. It is quite clear that about a, mil a billion years ago, a thousand million years ago, when plants began to walk around and were called animals and ate plants, uh, they were getting uh, they were getting the vitamins uh, in their food that the plants manufacture. And uh, because they no longer needed the machinery, they sloughed off the machinery. In consequence, every animal species that has been investigated requires exogenous vitamin A, vitamin B1, vitamin B6, riboflavin, B2, and niacin, and so on. But only a few animals require vitamin C. Why? Why didn't they slough off the machinery for manufacturing vitamin C? Because there wasn't enough vitamin C in the plant food. But if you take the plant food, raw natural plant food, to 108 of them and calculate the amount of vitamin C, the average amount is two and three tenths grams uh, for a day's rations for a 150 pound man. And if you take the 14 richest ones, it comes out nine grams. Uh, the two and three tenths grams wasn't enough, and perhaps not even the nine grams. But about 25 million years ago, ancestors of man were someplace where they, uh, in the tropics, where there were, was food that was especially rich in vitamin C, and it became advantageous for uh, the, uh, it became advent, the mutant, which, and these mutants are, keep occurring, of course, the mutant who couldn't synthesize vitamin C had an advantage over the wild type. All primates are descended from those animals. The primates require exogenous vitamin C. It's pretty clear that somewhere around nine grams, or the richest foods are 16 grams to a day's rations. Uh, this is getting close to the optimum, somewhere. The animals that manufacture vitamin C uh, do so at a rate proportional to body weight. A little animal manufactures a little, one ten times as big manufactures ten times as big. The amount manufactured is between two grams and 15 grams a day for uh, 150 pounds of animals. I believe that people would be much better off uh, in general if they ingested the proper amount of this special vitamin. Not only would it uh, protect them against colds, it would protect them also against other diseases. On the 11th of December, a Lancet, the issue of Lancet contained an article by Constance Spittle, British pathologist, on studies of uh, 58 normal subjects and 25 uh, people with atherosclerosis, in which she shows that ingesting a gram of ascorbic acid per day cuts down the serum cholesterol by between 50 and 100 uh, milligrams per deciliter. And she ends her paper with the statement, I conclude that atherosclerosis is nothing more than a chronic deficiency in vitamin C. 
I think that other diseases, but I don't have time to continue. I want to tell, make one more statement. There's been a lot of misrepresentation about the evidence about vitamin C in the common cold. There's been a lot of misrepresentation about the evidence of megavitamin therapy for schizophrenia. I'll give one example. Professor Ben in Montreal and his co-workers published a paper to, uh, several papers on uh, use of niacin or niacinamide for schizophrenia. One of them was to test the hypothesis that niacin acts as a demethylating agent and in this way helps to control schizophrenia. It is known that methionine, which is a methyl donating molecule, exacerbates schizophrenia. So he took 20 schizophrenics and gave each of them methionine. Half of them were given niacin, niacinamide, I think it was. The other half were given a placebo. And all 20 of them had their mental disease exacerbated. They became more seriously ill. The conclusion was that niacin does not counteract methionine. They gave the molecular weight of methionine is, is the same within 10% as the molecular weight of niacin. They gave these patients 20 grams a day of methionine and three grams a day of niacin. Why? Why? I suppose that none of them had studied chemistry. They hadn't learned about <laughs> the laws of stoichiometry. And this investigation is being quoted. Just last month, I saw where it was quoted as evidence against uh, megavitamin treatment of schizophrenia. I believe that there are great possibilities for uh, orthomolecular medicine. I think that medical schools should have departments of orthomolecular medicine. At the present time, a medical student gets perhaps one lecture during his period of training on nutrition, which is one aspect of orthomolecular medicine. I think that human beings individually need to treat themselves because doctors don't pay enough attention to them. They need to see for themselves how to uh, keep their health optimum. I think we are going to have a good world. You know, I believe that we are going to eliminate war from the world, and I believe that we are going to be able to eliminate uh, a good bit of suffering from the world. People will die, but I hope that they will lead good lives, that the distribution of the world's wealth will be such that every person will have the opportunity to lead a good life, and uh, uh, that uh, we shall have the sort of world that uh, man's extraordinary intellect uh, justifies. Thank you. In view of the lateness of the hour, the Paulings are leaving at 6 o'clock in the morning. We will not have a question session tonight. This concludes the 50th anniversary celebration. Thank you.